The Openness Rural and Regional Affairs Transport Legislation Committee Oversight of the Department of Infrastructure, Regional Development and Cities. Um, the committee is inquiring into matters of road safety under Senate Standing Order 252A. I welcome you all here today. Uh, there's a public hearing and a Hansard transcript uh, of the proceedings uh, is being made. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence they are protected by parliamentary privilege. Can we hand this out sometimes? It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to the committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It's also good to see that Senator Stirl was able to make it here on time this afternoon. The committee prefers all evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in private session. It is important that witnesses give the committee notice if they intend to ask to give evidence in camera. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken. The committee will determine whether to insist on an answer in regard to the ground that is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request the answer be given in camera. Such a request may, of course, also be made any other time. I remind senators that the Senate has resolved that an officer of the Department of the Commonwealth or the State shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and, and shall be given a reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits any questions asking for opinions on matters of public policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. Officers are also reminded that any claim that it would be contrary to the public interest to answer a question must be made by a minister and should be accompanied by a statement setting out the basis of the claim. I remind people in the hearing room to share their mobile phones or either switch off or turn to silent. Uh, finally, uh, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank those officers here today uh, for attending. If I might, before I invite uh, you, Ms Spence, or anyone to whom you delegate to make an opening statement, uh, with the indulgence of my committee colleagues. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like us to approach this this afternoon, particularly you, Mr Hoy, because we waited for your return. You're, everyone downloaded onto you while you were away. Uh, but, you know, can, can I urge, seriously urge you to listen to the substantive element of a question and you, will, you won't get a reaction from the committee if your answers are truncated and yes or no or maybe, because the committee members will then delve down and unpack it with you themselves, right? So what we don't want is a, we've got an hour, we want to get it done in an hour, otherwise this committee has a reputation, we will just simply come back at another time, another hour and another hour until we get to where we need to be. So I'd, I'd urge you to consider that as we, as we go along. Um, yes, so uh, Ms Spence, do you have uh, an opening statement? Uh, Pip Spence, Deputy Secretary, Transport Group in the Department of Infrastructure, Regional Development Cities. Uh, no, Senator, I'm very happy just to answer your questions. The only thing that I would note is one of the, um, the issues that was raised when we were here last time was who was actually consulted. We've pulled out an extract from the regulation impact statement that's got a full list of everyone who was consulted and a summary of what they, um, they said, so I thought that might be useful to, to table those, yeah. if that would help. Thank you. Can I um, open the batting centre still, do no, you no, mind? please do. Um, we joined at the Look, um, Mr Hoy, th this, we, we, firstly I think the, over time the committee has, has signalled that it supports the introduction of this technology uh, into the industry. And I'm not sure that that's inconsistent with, with um, the intentions of the government, but no doubt you'll let us know what you can about that as we go forward. Um, we know uh, from uh, briefings we've had, uh, not necessarily from the department, that there's been cost-benefit analysis done across uh, uh, the transport industry, if you like, uh, class by class of vehicle. Uh, we're given to understand there may be some real promise around articulated vehicles and that with this technology, and we'll hear from you on that. I'll, I'll ask you a specific question in a moment. We also hear that the jury may be out or, or has come back um, around heavy ridges or some classes of heavy ridges that the cost-benefit analysis did not support 
um, the adoption of the technology in, in that class of vehicles. We've definitely got an interest to, to interrogate you as to if that's the case, uh, and then if it is the case as to why we've arrived at that, on what basis. Uh, because the industry sent us signals at least that they're prepared to cop the cost on the chin they didn't regard as being high when having regard to the potential outcomes. So let me start with the big ticket question. <clears throat> Are you in a position to, uh, to advise the committee on whether it is your understanding that government is working towards uh, the adoption uh, of the technology as a compulsory uh, element within the transport industry. Well, in a very broad sense, I'm not asking you about these categories. We know that there's, it's not going to be on, on every vehicle. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the ESC. Yeah, the ESC. ESC. Uh, thank you, Senator. So Stephen Hoy, Director of the Standards Development um, Section, Department of Infrastructure, Regional Development and Cities. Um, the answer is yes. I know that's a truncated No, answer. that's all right. That's what we're looking yes. for. We, we'll, we'll delve down into it as we go. Um, is it fair to say then, as I indicated, that with uh, some classes or all classes, I don't know the answer to my own question, of heavy rigids, that it might not be applied within heavy rigids? Um, uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. So okay. we, we will be re-looking at heavy rigids. Yeah, but so, so, sorry, sorry, Chair. Go on, no, no. So, no. just be very careful. So, we know there's light rigids, medium rigids, and heavy rigids. Yes. So, you're talking about all rigids, I assume, are you? Chair? No, you, you go. I'm, I'm not an expert in the field. No, 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 but just so because Senator O'Sullivan has said heavy rigids. So, heavy rigids, when we met last time, were excluded, correct? Um, that's correct. So, right. so there, there are rigid vehicles, and heavy rigid yes, means I'm, anything above four and a half tons. Yes, I'm well aware. And then there's aware. categories yep. within that. Yes. So, are we now looking at all rigids above four and a half tons? So, we cover light rigid, medium rigid, heavy rigid, or are we still juries Ab out above four and a half tons, which, okay, which is known as heavy rigids. Okay. Sorry, chair. Yeah. So, so what your your so we we on the articulated vehicles, and you mm. can correct me on my terminology. Um, but on the articulated vehicles, <coughs> you've indicated that the government are looking positively at the introduction of ESC there. So we can just set that aside. That's correct. So that's already been legislated. Yep. Within the rigid classes, uh, you're re-looking at the heavy rigids? Re-looking or having a first look? or? So part of the... Um Part of the regulated part does cover articulated and it does cover some heavy rigids, what, what's known as the short wheelbase heavy okay. rigids. So and there's the an element of both in what's being legislated now. And yes, we are, um, we are looking at, we are re-looking at um, all heavy rigids now. Chief, okay. can I ask a question which might put this in some sort sure, of perspective? Of so electronic stability control is mandatory in all passenger vehicles, like cars. Yes, sir. Okay. And in, in then, the department, in going to look at where it would go next, went to articulated vehicles. And now you're coming back down to light rigids. The question, the, inner, the question people I know have is this. Why did you jump over the next biggest group of vehicles and go to the smallest group? Uh, Senator, Why we, did you do that? Senator, we didn't jump over them, so we considered all the heavy vehicles. And um, our recommendation was that, for now, we um, we legislate for articulated or prime movers. So why did you move from the largest well, they, fleet? His evidence, his evidence isn't that they did. Well, can I just make a point? Sorry, yeah. Senator. Prime movers are almost 13 times more likely to incur a fatality in a loss of control or rollover crash than rigid vehicles, and prime movers are over six times more likely to incur a serious injury in a loss of control or rollover crash compared to and rigid in vehicles. And the they represent how much of the fleet in percentage terms? Um, the, I don't know in percentage terms. Well, it's a very terms. small percentage of the fleet if you look at rigid vehicles. The, so That's the argument that safety regulators put to me, is the department went to the next, not to the next level of vehicles that would benefit the most by ESC, they went to the smallest group at the heavier end of the vehicle chain. That's, that's the only question I have. Yes. Right. Well, let, let, let me. Can I? Can I? Can I do this in, just to keep this in a heading in a direction? I, I'd like to establish where we are with each of these classes first, and then 
and then the senators and others, uh, including myself, might want to uh, have you explain the journey. But we've already now established that some heavy rigids and articulated. Uh, it's it's uh, been introduced in legislation, it's compulsory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some questions about whether there's any exemptions in that space, override um, capacity and so on. But now we're back and we know from motor, vehicle, motor vehicles, uh, light motor vehicles, that it's compulsory, correct? Mm, correct. And now we're looking at the gap in the middle, right? So bigger than a car, smaller than a, a semi-trailer. Um, so it seemed like you broke the heavy rigid into a couple of categories, is that correct? There was ones who have been accommodated in the legislation and ones who are now the subject of, of further consideration, is that right? That's correct. So we'll, we'll, call them the, we'll call them the heavy rigid remainder mob. And there are vehicles then that are light rigid, medium rigid? What, what? We've, got, we've got the four and a half tonne, everything from four and a half tonne, but we've missed the light trucks. Yes. Yeah, so, so the heavy rigids that are in the, the uh, legislation are 4.5 tonne and above. Is that right? Have I got that right? Um, <clears throat> sorry, the, the, le the legislation covers braking of all heavy vehicles. So, so we're talking about the ESC component of that. Um, the ESC component will uh, cover all prime movers. And we know that prime movers are virtually all over 12 tonnes. Yeah, sorry, Mr Hall, we know that, but sorry, I thought... No, no, I said... don't, I don't, Senator. I, okay, all right. Sorry, I don't. So they're over 12 tonnes, yep. Over 12 tonnes. And we are now looking at, or re-looking at... Um... But, Woo, before you go there, yes. you said there's some yes. heavy rigids that are captured in that legislation. Sorry, yes. Are, are you I've telling been, me I've, now heavy rigids uh, have to be over 12 tonne to be caught, or...? Yes, they do, yes. Right, so... What we got is, let's not even talk about heavy rigid or, or thing, every vehicle over 12 tonne is captured by the legislation. Um, not long wheelbase over 12 tonnes, Senator. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, um, right, well, we'll come back common. to that. Yeah. But then you have <clears throat> heavy rigid vehicles who are sub 12 tonne, is that right? You do, um, the, but they're not captured by this. No, I understand they're not captured. Correct. Yes. But I, I understood you to say that you were re-looking at that That's correct, yes. cohort of trucks. Yes. Are there some other cohorts of trucks that you <clears throat> that weren't captured by the legislation and are not subject of, of any current consideration? So a medium rigid, a light rigid, something else? Um, there will be between <coughs> a light commercial vehicle and a heavy commercial, uh, sorry, a light commercial vehicle and a uh, mid-weight commercial vehicle between three and a half and four and a half tonnes that we're not looking at. Okay, so we're re-looking at the vehicles now, four and a half tonnes through to 12 tonne? And above. And above, no, I got that. Well, I thought the above ones have been captured, but... Some of the rigids have, but some of them have not. The short wheelbase rigids over 12 tonnes have been captured, but the long wheelbase okay, over 12 tonnes... Okay, so we'll tons. come back to them. and. Um, but then below four and a half tonne, <coughs> so we're talking about four tonnes, three tonnes, two tonnes, they're not under active consideration at the moment. They've been considered and, and, and the decision was taken not to recommend they be captured by the legislation. They have been considered up to three and a half tonnes. Um, there's been two, two areas of regulation, and this is worldwide, looking at lighter vehicles, passenger cars, that have <coughs> extended up to what's called like commercial vehicles, up to three and a half tonnes, and in the other direction from the very heavy vehicles. There's a group right in the middle, three and a half to four and a half tonnes, that um, do not, are, are, not, are not being considered just because <coughs> of the characteristics of them. But had they been considered, or were they exempted from the very early consideration of vehicles for this technology. They were exempted from the early consideration, so the... the right, so when, when the industry tells us that some classes were exempted because cost-benefit analysis, they, they said that your department has told them, cost-benefit analysis didn't support the argument for the, for the inclusion of the technology, mm -hmm. is it fair to say they are the ones you're now re-looking at? That's correct. Okay. 
on now, clear. Sanders Steele. Yeah, I'll just... OK, thanks, Chair. So, Ms Spence, what you've given us now here, Appendix 16 Technical Liaison Group, and there's a host of associations and all that there, were they all consulted in terms of who should cop compulsory uh, ESC or were they just broken into some people left out? Um, I'll actually ask Mr Hoy. Oh, Mr Hoy. <laughs> they were all consulted, Senator. So, OK. All right. And the reason why I'd be here... So we've asked the Australian Motorcycle Council should trucks have AES, uh, EESC. So there we do it. Well, what we do is we um, provide the regulation impact statement and the discussions within a forum where the Motorcycle Council is present, and then they decide whether they want to respond. So do they get an even vote to say? I'm not picking on them. I think no, what they do for motorbikes is great. What they do for prime no, movers, I don't know. Yes, it's it's not it's not a vote, but. Um, they, they didn't respond to this yeah. uh, oh, okay. statement. Mm. Yeah, OK. These are the people that we approached yeah. Yeah. Um, and gave them the details. And um, But whether whether they respond or not, the, there's an attachment as well which sets out the number of submissions that were received. Sure, received I haven't well. had a chance yeah. to go yeah. through that yet. So do the New Zealanders have a say in it? Yep. It's the same, same as well, that we, we approached them with the information. No, did they? Did they, Mr. Did the New Zealanders say that's a good idea or a bad idea? The New Zealanders um, are part of the forum, but they didn't make a submission. They didn't, so they didn't have any input into it at all? I beg your pardon? They didn't have any input into it at all? Uh, not into that um, no, okay. response to the impact statement. Yeah, no. That's great. Because what I... See, I'm happy with the ESC where that's going, OK? I, I want to say like, that's, that's understandable now. And that we were talking about AEB and all sorts of other stuff mm. too. And I know with Ms Naki and Gama, um, we were talking about... Senator uh, um, Gallagher and I were uh, following down the uh, autonomous emergency braking stuff. So what I really wanted to get to is, is we have to have a regulatory impact statement and I want to know who's saying, no, we don't want it, and for what reasons they have in it. Because, you see, how does that all regulatory impact statement mean? And I can sit here and waffle on about 1,200 lives. It's not waffle, but it's true. 1,200 lives lost a year, and there's a myriad of accidents and reasons why, and 35,000 people getting injured each year. Um, so explain to me how you work out a regulatory impact statement. When we talk about road, these, these uh, minimum, right. you know, these uh, um, road safety initiatives into okay. vehicles. So, vehicles. So Sharon Yakrangama, General Manager, Vehicle Safety Standards Branch, Department of Infrastructure, Regional Vef Development and Cities. So, Senators, the, um, the Technical Liaison Group is a standing consultative forum that we have on ADR. So it wasn't established specifically for this, this uh, regulatory impact yep. statement. Yep. But, however, we consult them all the time on any ADR development. So this is the standing consultative forum. On the second page of Appendix 17 was um, the industry reference group specifically for the National Heavy Vehicle Braking Strategy. Great, thank you. And I didn't want to start reading so, while you were talking, Mr Hoy. That's why I didn't read. Yeah. Okay, so that's great. So, so that's going, a, yeah. a more limited group. Um, everybody was consulted generally. This is more targeted consult consultation with this specific Look, group. That okay. makes a lot of sense. So let's go through this. So if we um, go into, so just as a general level, so the. Um, the technical requirements were developed over a two-year period in consultation with all of these period mm -hmm. people. Um, we held a seven-week public consultation period in 2017-18 um, with a media release and we sent out to all stakeholders in those vehicle safety forums, Yes, uh, including a media release um, by the Minister and the Department. So there were 11 submissions. Um, that were received, and that's in the next. That's next um, page. The is summary it? of those is in the next um, in the landscape part of that appendix uh, 18. So oh, that's all right. That's so appendix 18 has a summary of all the submissions received. Okay, so okay. we've got air brake systems proprietary limited. Are they part of that suppliers association? Are they? Uh, they would have made. Um, well, An individual separate. submission, is that correct? Individual, sir? OK. And what did they say? They don't support Arta. 6 We understand they're under, they belong to ARTSA. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, uh, 
which one? Yeah. So that's the first yep. one. Sorry, the we just need to understand yep. how this all works. Yep. So Appendix 18, Summary of Public Comments. Yep. So they belong to the Australian Road Transport Suppliers Association. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yep. No worries. Yep. Was okay. there anyone, I mean I can flick so, through one by one, but I don't want to take up the committee's time and yours. Mm. Was there anyone who was opposed to it? Of these? Uh, into, so it, we, it came back with what was supported. So, so uh, three industry bodies, peak bodies, favoured option 6A, which is yes. inclusive. So that was um, uh, the livestock. ATA, livestockies. Sorry, and, I and Nat Road. And who? Nat Road. Nat Road. Yep. Okay. Yep. Keep going. So Sorry. One state government, New South Wales, favoured. So, okay, we've got the three associations. Yep. And they, and, and just. So for you, Chair, we got an answer back. The ATA, did you see? They came back and showed their representation through their state organisations, uh, associate members and all sorts. So they do represent a large chunk. That's this document here. That's it, mate. Yes. yes. So, that, so that was a query. They do represent a, a huge chunk. Nat Roads, of course, and the livestockies with the livestock. Great. So sorry, Miss uh, Nicky Gama. Keep mm. going. What else okay. Were you so then one state government, which New is South New Wales. South Wales, favoured 6A, which was the broad regulation option, including yep. rigids. Uh, one brake system supplier or can consultant um, supported option 6C. And I that saw was, that. Can you tell me why only 6C? A, 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 that's um, ABS proprietary limits. Yeah, so what was their you? reason for um, only going to 6C, which helped me out, which was more narrow, wasn't it? It was just the prime movers. Just the what, sorry? Just the prime movers, prime movers. Senator. Yeah, just the prime so, mover. So help me, tell me why the breaking association or the yes. systems. So that's um, actually the first entry there on the um, on page 178 of that excerpt. Yep. So, uh, so the content summary, they support mandating of automatic slack adjusters on all trailer brake systems. So, so we've only been talking about heavy rigid and prime movers today, but the sure. RIS actually covered buses and heavy trailers as well. Okay. So, that's, so this other element. So, so, so to help so, you out, Ms Naki, again, where I'm going to is I want to, if you can help me, tell me why someone would um, not want to support the hamburger with the lot when it comes to making these vehicles as safe as possible. If you um, if you don't have that, I can go. Um, yes, well, it's not. It's it didn't come through their submission, but I know that they are um, technical experts in braking, and that they've um, been involved uh, over a number of years over some compatibility issues and some technical issues. Do you have a breakdown of all their reasons why they wanted the support? Let me put this to you, Mr. Horn. I won't. Don't want to bore people. I've thrown a road train off the road and it frightens the living daylights out of you, trust me, okay? You couldn't imagine how scary that is. Um, so I'd really like to know why a technical uh, company would want only the prime movers and didn't want the full lot to back in the, the, the transport industry. And they may have a very good reason, mm -hmm. I just want to know why. Uh, well, they, did, they wanted the prime movers, but uh, as you recall, 6C also includes the trailers as well, and that was a big concern of those. That the, they wanted the... Sorry, the, you're a bit the, hard to hear. The prime movers and the trailers, so the articulated unit as a whole, yep. and all the trailers as well. So they, they were supporting that. Um, I think that they recognised uh, two things. They recognised the difficulty of the proposal of... Uh, of developing heavy vehicle braking generally, and so they saw that this was a very good proposal to to take us the next step. Um, they also had um, concerns about generally compatibility between new vehicles and older vehicles, and there was a lot of work that the industry did on that. And they also understood that there um, might be some, or there would be some difficulties with the uh, with the heavy rigid vehicles, the test requirements for it, and there were still some things that had to be sorted out. With so, did they leave us down, so did it come down to a, a, a cost thing? Look, it's simple. I always find the easiest way is we, you know, for all new vehicles onward. I think is always a fair mm -hmm. way, so you're not ambushing people and all sorts. Is that what the cut it to? Short was, were they favourable of, oh, hang on, if we're moving to all new vehicles? Because you've touched on vehicles that are already out there and all that. Um, what I, what I, I guess I didn't make um, clear was, no, they were talking about 
uh, the different types of vehicles. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about uh, the difference between having a car with ESC that goes on the road that works independently and having a truck with ESC that then has to couple up with another truck that may have ESC, oh, sorry, a trailer yep. that may or may not have ESC. Okay. So as, as you're aware, with heavy vehicles, compatibility is a real issue between older and newer vehicles. Well, I understand with older trailers and newer trailers, but the prime mover is still the same up the front, but okay, I'll get that. All right, so we've got them. Tell me who else put, were making comment and, and who were. So we've got three absolutely in favour of 6A, uh, four with the New South Wales government. The brake people were 6C for their reasons. Yeah. Who else? So there was a tyre services consultant, so Tire Safe Australia, that favoured 6A. Tire Safe, and tire who safe. are they? Um, they're a, are they a consultancy? consultancy? Okay, yep. yep, that's fine. And um, they fall under the the Suppliers Association, I assume. Okay. Yep. Right? Um, another peak industry body, the Truck Industry Council, um, supported option 6C, which is the narrower one, with consideration of 6A in the next phase of work in consultation with the industry. So the next phase of work is include um, the broader option as part for heavy rigids as part of our consideration of automated emergency braking. So the Truck Industry Council, help me out, they're the manufacturers? Truck, truck manufacturers, Right, yes. okay. And why did they not want to go to 6A, my words, the hamburger with a lot to start with, if the client's prepared to pay? Yeah, um, well, there's a, probably a couple of answers to that, <clears throat> if the client's prepared to pay. the. Um, it's not certain whether the client would pay or whether they, sorry, they would Mr. absorb Hoy. the cost. Sorry, Mr. Hoy. Let's rephrase that. Sorry, that's not fair on you. If it was decided that the government would mandate ESC into uh, into these vehicles, so why did they prefer the 6C option? Uh, well, my understanding, and, and I'm being careful not to speak for these organisations, I'm just okay. giving my understanding of, of their um, what they thought. Um, was similar to the brake analysis, or sorry, the brake specialists, that the package as it stands is a very good package to put through now, and that there are some residual technical issues around, um, around the rigid vehicles. Uh, let me come, come back to you. I'm just a bit lost there. So the Truck Industry Council represent the manufacturers, so it's not just brand new trucks. They're also, are they representing the second hand fleet? I didn't think they were, but are they? They're representing brand new manufacturers and importers. So why would they want to run an argument, to the best of your knowledge, Mr Hoy, that it's a little bit too hard because there's different systems that are already out there if we're talking about all new vehicles coming into this country, either by import or being manufactured here? I'm completely lost to their argument so far. So I'd mentioned before that they, um, they still saw some uh, residual testing and technical issues with the heavy rigid vehicles. So, so they were so all right on the prime movers. Yes. But on the rigids, they have a testing thing. I think, Senator, what probably mm. a better way of phrasing it is they were keen to get the benefits quickly on the prime, prime movers, movers and trailers, yep. so mandate now but do some further work to make sure okay. that you were getting it right on the on the others. So it wasn't that they weren't supporting it, there was just a timing okay. issue that they wanted to work through. All right, that yeah. makes that yes. easier for me. Yes. So there we go, that's three, four, five, six, seven, keep going. Okay, um, the next one is a state government that supported 6C, supported 6C but uh, expressed a favour for 6A, that was South Australia. Um, Excuse me for a second, so I'll just talk to Mr Adelaide. You need okay. to sort that out. Okay, yeah. keep going. No, no, right. These people so, need to sort themselves out, mate. This <laughs> um, is the problem here. Okay, keep going. So they're happy for 6... What? Sorry? So they favoured 6A, but they, they favoured the 6A, but supported the recommendation of 6C because of the cost-benefit analysis. Right. Now, let's go. No. I don't know what could possibly go through the South Australian yep. minds at this stage. No. So they, no. they, they like the 6A, but because of the, the, the cost, you know, what do you call it? The, um, the, cost, the benefit cost analysis. The benefit cost, they go for 6C. What is their logic for that? Have, I think, Senator, I mean, it's very difficult for us to speak on behalf yeah. of, of those of sure. people making the submission. So we're just reporting what they 
um, what the advice they included in the submissions as to what their position was, but I don't think sure. it's really reasonable for us to to try to go beyond what they actually included in their you, submissions. Okay, and this is and look, I, I accept where you're coming from because this is where I have a problem because these people have a weighted voice or something, and for a government that is happy to you know not happy, but if the government's losing people on the roads or trucks are rolling over and yet they can be convinced that they must go for the cheaper option because someone got in their shell like. I don't expect you to answer that. I really have a problem with that. So yeah. um, the laws need to be fixed up. So you have the ability to say, well, hang on, now prove for the benefit. What's the cost yeah. benefit? And Senator, I'd like to look at it that where we've taken the immediate decision around those ones where there was no questions and now we're looking at the remainder once you right. get rid of the uh, okay. below 4.5 so sure. that we, as part of the AEB work, we're looking yeah. at where, which other trucks you should mandate ESC. And I think that's a fair question for us to ask the South Australian people what is their, what's their reasons around this because they do have a say in this and they're influencing federal... I don't think I need to go. I think everyone knows what I think about that. All right, so who else so have we got? Last one. Um, one more state government um, favoured option 6B, which was partway between uh, 6C and A, so another mm. mid-range... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was included in... Who, who was that? Be the, um, Queensland. So not not all of um, all vehicles, but That's a, a larger enough. group than than um, what was in 6C. That's throwing a curveball at me. What's the 6B? 6B includes um, all of the rigid, heavy rigid, sorry. So over 12 <laughs> rigid 12 over 12 tonnes. tonnes. Oh, so prime movers and heavy rigids over uh, yeah, 12 so short tonnes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Which, is, which is the option that was adopted? No. The option, Senator, the option that was adopted um, did pick up the short wheelbase versions of those. But not the long Heavy wheel. rigids above 12 tonnes. Okay. So, so which one got adopted? Six what? 6C, 6C plus, plus 6C after plus. consultation on the rears. But hang we moved on. some of the heavy into 6C, so it became 6C plus. Okay. So we've gone for the, we've gone for the poverty pack. We've gone for the easiest way, just the prime movers. Is that what we've done? We've done prime movers plus heavy rigid vehicles with a short wheelbase. Is what six is that? Sorry, it was post. Sorry, so, um, this that, is six C plus. Was, yeah, six it, it plus. Sorry, you people got language all your own. It wasn't one of the options, but it was post consultation when we got the feedback. This is like, yes, Minister. Sorry, forget then, oh. we, then we worked with the ATA and, the, and TIC, the manufacturers and the ATA on a um, on a, a compromise a six C plus that brings in some more vehicles <laughs> on the ones that they were particularly concerned about. And which was actually welcomed by the ATA at the time. Of oh, the you know why? Because they've actually thought we've finally got something moving in the right direction. But, I mean, you know, Jesus. I shouldn't say that. I should say shit. I mean, can, you know, it's, it's reported here. Yeah, we're talking about new bloody selected vehicles. Selected heavy in. vehicles will be mandated July 2019 and some buses. Which selected heavy vehicles will be mandated in July of 19? That's the uh, the prime movers and the short wheelbase rigids above 12 tonnes, Senator. So we proved ESC in the in the passenger fleet, the car fleet. It's accepted in the United States and the European Union that it's fundamental to the commercial fleet. And we went from cars to prime movers and a, a what is it, a long wheelbase rigid? Short wheelbase over wheelbase 12 tonnes. Why don't we just do what the European Union is looking at, which is make it compulsory for commercial vehicles? Why do we dissect things into tiny slivers when we know fundamentally that ESC works? There's no dispute that at the table, is there? Does anybody at the table dispute that ES electronic stability control works for all vehicles? Does anybody dispute that? Senator, it works, but it... Um, works in different ways and different amounts, and it costs different amounts for different okay. classes so of vehicles. I accept both of those contributions. It works mm -hmm. differently and it costs. So given that 200 odd people die in heavy vehicle accidents a year, and some of the reports I see say that electronic stability control can impact significantly on loss of control and single vehicle rollovers, potentially saving 126 people a year. Are we talking about 
a cost there because that costs employers a lot of money. That, that 126 figure is the estimated lives saved as a result of the regulations that have been mandated. Right. So that's for the prime movers and the okay. short wheelbase heavy rigid trucks. Yeah. And it's over 45 years, not one year. Yeah. Sorry? It's over 45 years yeah. as the outcome of 15 years worth of regulation of mandating okay. for new vehicles. Okay. So, so, so can, can I just get a, a so why do you move from it's proven in the in the in the passenger fleet or the car fleet to segments of the commercial fleet? Why don't you take a whole of commercial fleet approach? One you've said is cost, and two is it works differently. But can we go into how it works differently? It's still positively beneficial. It doesn't work backwards, does it? Does electronic stability control is that proven to be more less safe? in commercial vehicles? No, sir. It is, it is more That's safe. a great answer if you listen to the chair. Well, let's just, let, let's try it this way. Let's put aside the vehicles that are captured by the legislation mm -hmm. and regulation. Let's put aside the vehicles that are currently under um, reconsideration, if that's the term, because I, I'd be surprised if eventually we didn't probably adopt something. Well, let me ask you, rather than me put a connotation on it, do you, do you personally believe that that cohort of vehicles that you're revisiting um, will, will end up being captured by this legislation or like legislation or regulation? Do you think that's where it might end up? Senator, uh, this, my sense is that it will. All right, so let's just put, put them aside now. With yeah, all the motor cars and passenger area. vehicles out this side. How and now, now we're left with this this uh, three and a half to four and a half tonne category of vehicles, correct? Now I just, in plain... No, no. Sorry, Senator, uh, we are, I think we're talking about, we might be talking about different categories of vehicles. There's three and a half to four and a half tonnes. Yes. And that was not part of the original... The original no, I, 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 that's, sorry. let me make the yes. point again. Yes, sorry. We know that there are some vehicles captured by the regulation. Get them out of your head. We know that there are some vehicles that you're re-looking at and, and you've sent, and I will, I will never hold you to it, Mr Hoy, because you're in a difficult position, but you think there's a positive signal that we may adopt some form of regulation around uh, ESC in relation to that cohort of vehicles. We've got passenger vehicles down at the bottom end, they've all got it. <clears throat> I'm talking about the ones in the middle, the black box, that do not have it, and are not under active consideration, right? Yes, Senator. So are we on the same wave wavelength with that cohort of vehicles? They're not under active consideration. Correct. Correct. And do they comprise the not... majority of the fleet? I, I think they, sorry, I think they comprise a, a minority of the fleet, those particular vehicles. I don't have the exact numbers. Sorry? Three and a half to four and a half. Three and a half to no, four and a half. The one's not under consideration. Yeah, three and a half yes. to four and a half. I think they would comprise a minority. You don't know. Can fleet. you on notice just give us a dissection of the fleet? You know, what you're looking at now, what you, how many vehicles what? you'll fix, and what's in the, uh, in the other categories that are by, by weight, all right? Mm, yes, sir. So, Mr Hoy, what, what I'm interested in, <clears throat> what I'm interested in, and we're going to call... We, we, we'll call these the 3.5s to 4.5s, just to give them a name, right, without getting strictly the thing. Why did they not come under active consideration for the application of this technology in the first place? I've heard a lot of questions on it, I've heard a lot of answers, but give it to me as plain English as possible. As why, why, why weren't they in, in active consideration in the very beginning? As plain English as possible, Senator, they're a class of vehicles that there's very few crashes with. Um, they're generally bigger and heavier than the smaller vehicles, so they come off a lot sure. better in a crash, but they're not big enough to have stability issues like heavy okay. um, so, so vehicles. Guys, we've got a snapshot there. Did you hear that? And yes. let me reinforce yeah. it. I, I understand that. They're, they're, there's less uh, uh, fatality or injuries related to their movements. I don't they make a, I well, don't right, well, you, well, you, you, don't, you don't need to accept. No, well, there needs to be evidence, though, to mm -hmm. make no, that well, statement. Well, no, but we'll explore it 
um, Alex, I'm trying to capture. No, no. I'm trying to capture this, and then we can ask for questions on those. Yep. They make up a fraction of the fleet, or a small fraction of the fleet, or a limited, so in number. They don't suffer from stability, uh, instability as much as the cohorts above and below. And thirdly, uh, insofar in as the statistics were able to guide and inform your work, uh, they, they, as a percentage on their numbers or the amount of miles they do, whatever it happened to be, the statistics say that there are less, many less fatalities uh, involved and injuries. Is that right? Does that capture the three things that, after careful consideration, decided to put this cohort out to pasture, if you like, for want of a better term? I think that captures it well, Senator. Okay. So, Mr Hoy, the, the things that I'll beat my colleagues to the punch here. We, we want the stats that show their percentage of the fleet. We want the stats upon which uh, a decision, the decision relied that um, uh, pound for pound that they were, had less incidents. And we want, the, we want the science or the engineering technology that says that they don't have the stability, instability issues, if we can. Right? So we, we, I don't, can't speak from our colleagues, but we'll sort of stay away from that a little bit, um, I think, until you're able to provide us with that information and come back together. My interest Can I add is one thing, Senator? Sorry sure. to, to interrupt. Um, yes, we're happy to provide that. Um, that's not to say that those have been... Um, uh, that class of vehicles, we've said we're not going to do anything about in the future. Okay, well, let me ask we, you that question then. We, we know the that there's a cohort that are under active reconsideration. Correct. Uh, are you suggesting that these could well be the next cab off the rank to have a rethink, a relook? Yes, Senator, they could. Okay. So, what would take them out of the evidence and the science said to us, look, they're not as significant as the others, but now we'll bring them back in for a, a, a relook. Is it is it coming from industry? Is it coming from us? There's continued interest uh, in relation to this. What what's driving the revisit on this cohort of vehicles, um, <coughs> Senator? So the potential revisit um, would be from a variety of sources, including yourself, including um, what, what is happening in other markets, including um, uh, any kind of road safety research, including uh, from industry, from operators. So it's from a variety of sources. All right, Mr Hoy, can, can, I, can, can I, I ask a question on that, though? Yes, of course. So I'm really interested in how you do your, for want of a better description, target selection, right? So ha how it works within the department how you actually decide where you utilise your criteria. And if we take electronic stability control, I know from personal experience that it was delayed because Mitsubishi couldn't do it in Adelaide. We don't have that constraint anymore. Sure. So we've now got it in every, every car. We've now got it in every motorbike. And my contention is, you know, you did a whole round of tests, I think it was Mr Folds, Someone selected that we look at ESC for motorbikes, which have never been manufactured in Australia, and it was proven overseas. But we had to do our own ADR selection and, and evaluation. So I have no confidence or no clarity on how you do make the decision the Chair's just asked you. How do you prioritise stuff that's really critical and important? And is it based on evidence about the size of the fleet, the level of the risk, and the improvements gained? And if you want to take that on notice, I'd be happy to read the answer. Well, to a certain you... extent, Mr Hoy has addressed those things. Well, because how did they get to motorbikes well, before trucks? Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> no but that wasn't the burden of your question. Well, yes, it is. The the burden, the burden, there's no clarity. <clears throat> the burden of your question was how did this, in, in, in my, my, tone, my, my ear to it, was how did this cohort get left out of the exercise? And, and Mr Hoy has and, and so, so. Mr. Hoy has covered that. Yes, uh, now, yeah. if we want to ask specifically, and we should, so um, now that Senator Gallagher's clarified this, what brought motorbikes into it? So what, what, what that got them in the exercise? Can we just clarify? Uh, uh, electronic Yabin stability Gama? control is not mandated for motorcycles. It was, autom it was um, uh, ABS. 
ABS. Anti-lock braking anti systems. ABS. So that's a, a different but that technology. that was a target selection of your department. Yes. Yes. That was the big issue you were working it's, on, Mr. It's Morris. not our department, um, Senator. Uh, we, we, develop, we develop our priorities <clears throat> under the National Road Safety Strategy through the Transport and Infrastructure Council selects? of Minister. So we do it based on um, data from evidence of what vehicles are involved in, in, in crashes and the type of failures of vehicles that result in those crashes. So. ESC itself, Who we were talking about. Is the director or the, it, it's the Spence? it's the Transport and Infrastructure Council of Ministers, state and territory. They sign off on it. Yes. And so there's a on what the priorities are that we work okay. on. Yeah. So it's set out. So there's a national road safety strategy, and every three years there's a there's a road um, an action plan that um, it, it takes fall with the um, the commitments that are made, set out in the. Um, strategy. So that plan said ABS on uh, motorcycles is the most important issue, that the ADR issue we've got. Despite the fact we don't make motorcycles and we could simply take the overseas evidence and say it's mandatory, we decided to do that. Well, I think in, in fairness, and I, I, we, we should ask Ms Betts to comment on this, is we very, it seems to me, sadly, that we very rarely take on, it doesn't matter whether it's drugs going on to the PBS or medical technologies, uh, we had it with the APVMA, it seems like we don't take any real notice of the work done by the developed nations around the approval of these sorts of things. And uh, I'd, I'd be happy for you to comment on that, Ms Spence, if you're able. Well, look, <coughs> sir, what I would say is we're actively looking at, um, and again, it, you, the, um, there was a, a review of the road safety strategy and one of the recommendations that came from that was we need to do more to um, introduce new technologies that might improve s safety outcomes um, faster that yeah, we but need that's to... not what we're... Uh, well, sorry. But it's sort of... Yeah, the, it the, does the, tie This into, thing in that tail, yeah. I understand that. But right now, and I'm, I'm with Senator Gallagher on this, <clears throat> if there's a new technology, say, developed in Germany, and it goes through rigorous testing and audit and due diligence and a whole range of things before it's allowed into the... European marketplace, for example, and there's a whole body of peer-reviewed technical evidence, mm. if, if it's a technical issue. Um, what Senator Gallagher's saying is if you've got a country like that who've been through a very rigorous program, why don't we just adopt it that it's good? There's my first question. <clears throat> and in the absence of doing that, it would seem that there is an absence in many parts of government decision-making. <clears throat> to what extent is their work reviewed again by us and parts or all of it adopted in our decision-making <clears throat> process, whether this is a good thing or not? So they're two separate questions, but related. Um, on the first one, you, you're right. We don't just um, ad adopt um, what's happening internationally, but we are looking at are there, are there better ways that we should be making our decisions? And that includes, is there greater weight that we can give to um, what's signed off internationally? I'll let Mr Hoy go into more detail, but yes, we do draw on what research and um, decisions that have been made internationally in the way in which we currently make our um, decisions around what, what's mandated and what's not. Can I not. just, sorry, before you come on there, if I please, Chair, you remember the, the inquiry we did on this and I've made the statement that we dumb cars down to bring them into this nation. And as to go on, that technology is out there. It's done through the US, through the EU, but somehow us Aussies think, well, uh, well, we're probably smarter than they all are. Well, Ms Spencer's... I'm not having a go at these poor at people. That, They're just implementing I'm, the crap I'm, policy. I'm pleased to hear that the mm. process is under review. And uh, to the extent that we might have a view about it, I really think in developed nations, particularly those with superior technologies, the Japans and the Germanys of the world, I think we need to find a way to give greater weight to the journey they've, they've taken to arrive at a point. Um, but Mr Hoy was just invited to make a comment. What's your discipline, Mr Hoy? Are you an engineer or...? Yes, I am, Senator. So you're a process engineer, technical engineer? I'm a mechanical engineer. You're a mechanical so. engineer. All right. I think Ms Spence was, was hoping you might contribute to that yes. this process of <laughs> evaluation. <laughs> yes, no, um, I, no, I agree with Ms Spence. So uh, we take as much international information as we can. 
But ultimately, just like every country, we have to justify it on our own crash standards and the vehicles that are, sorry, on our own crash statistics and the vehicles that are being brought in and the configuration of the vehicles that are being brought in um, to Australia. So can I say that the US has not, um, the US has mandated ESC for heavy vehicles uh, for prime movers only, and they will be in the future looking at rigid vehicles. So. Um, we're similar to the to the US in that respect. And there are there operating conditions here, both the environment of the operation and the nature and type of the operation, speed limits, road surface uh, types, uh, uh, the type of freight that might dominate a particular market. Um, you know, with a freight, uh, it often amazes me. Well, it doesn't amaze me when we move a lot of cattle, and it doesn't amaze me that when all you know, 50 tonne of cattle all move over to one side of a truck on a slope, it's not long before it'll go over. So is all of that, one, is, 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 does that inhibit the ability just to adopt someone else's application of a technology to, for us? Uh, yes, it does. So, so those environmental conditions, you're quite right. And there's also the, um, uh, the configuration of the vehicles in Australia, with heavy vehicles, as you probably know, there's a blend of US type designs and European type designs and Japanese type designs. So there's all sorts of compatibility issues around that, such as the voltages that the systems work at, et cetera. So with heavy vehicles, there's that unique characteristic of it's a mix of things from around the world that, that are meeting slightly different standards. And we're trying to smooth that out for the use in Australia. Now, with regard to the environment, yes, there was, um, there was an issue with the robustness of systems like ESC and ABS when used on the rougher roads in Australia, and particularly out regional and particularly out on unmade roads. So uh, we did a lot of work with industry over that, over reliability, and we went and visited around Australia to see what the issues were, et cetera. So there are, there are right. differences. So on that point, I want to ask a question. Uh, these guys may follow through. Um, I had transport operators in my office this afternoon in, in, in um, uh, livestock transport operators, mm. and they, they talk about if they've, if they've slowed down to go into um, uh, a crossing of a gully, for example, where one trailer may, where there may be some stability issues, but they're only travelling at you know, some small pace, oh. mm. that it can trigger these, trigger these systems and uh, they thought that one of the options might be to have an override capacity uh, in the truck. Uh, the other one I had was, was uh, from, again, livestock operator out of the Northern Territory some weeks ago, who talked about if then Glenn will have probably some antidotal evidence to contribute, but if they come along and there's, you know, there's 100 kangaroos in a drought time sitting in the middle of the road or 10 bullocks, it's not an option to do anything but plough into them. <coughs> so, at that point, they were against the use of the brakes. They thought that this this system, and I don't pretend to understand exactly what it does, would would do more more harm than good. Mm. So, is there any consideration about the capacity of the operator to override in certain circumstances, and including emergency overriding capacity if they see a mob of bullocks and they can't? Uh, yes, Senator, there is. With the running into the bullocks or the kangaroos, that might be more about AEB, the automatic braking systems, yes. whereas ESC is just trying to keep the, the system stable, the okay. vehicle stable right. on the road. Yep. Um, but you're right about the moving at low speed through paddocks, and um, that was a particular issue raised, and uh, we've dealt with that in the regulation. We do allow for a switch to switch it off. Okay. The counter to that is people that say, we don't like having safety systems where you switch them Turn off. Them off. Yeah. Yes, that's right. So that's the counter to it. So what we've done is that it automatically comes back on above, it was agreed through industry above 40k, it will automatically reset and, and come okay. on again. All right. Gents, uh, without limiting, we, we, we're just about at time. I'm wondering yeah. whether you have any I just specific... Want to up, just so I'm clear. Just no, no, well, we minute. can do that, but I'm, I'm just asking you to take into account if you've got any no. uh, questions on notice that we'd like them to supply us with data and information. Okay. So it's your call, Lynn. Thanks, thanks, Chair. All right, so just in summary, so we had nine participants through the public um, consultation period. Um, 
I think it was, it was 11. 11. Oh, I only got nine, so I'm missing two. I've got three associations. I've got a New South Wales government, the Breaking Mob, Tire Safety Australia, Truck Industry Council, South Australian government, Queensland government. Correct. I've got nine. Yeah, we've, stood, we've got um, another peak industry body, which is HVIA, the Heavy Vehicle Industry Association. Hang on, HVIA. A. Who are they? Heavy Vehicle Industry uh, they, Association. They represent a lot of um, particularly trailer manufacturers and, oh, and, trailer. Vehicle, and vehicle body um, finishers. Mm. Oh, I thought you meant it was a trucking mob. Uh, okay, no, trailer heavy, manufacturer. Heavy, heavy Vehicle Industry Association. So a lot, they do a lot of um, truck body finishing, represent people. Like right, that. thank you. Yeah. Yep. So they make dollies and do all that yep. sort of yes. stuff. Okay, what was so the... And the other, they supported, um, supported option 6C but favoured 6A, similarly to others. You know, yep, um, yep. Supported the analysis. No, no, that's good. Yeah. Um, and the final one was an engineering cons consultant organisation that, oppo that opposed all regulatory options. Now tell me who this so, so that was, character um, is, all these characters. Uh, it was uh, McLean Technical Services. McLean, let's get this out here, McLean it's in Technical, the summary. it's in the back here? Yep. Okay, and, and Mr Hoy, did you meet with this mob? Were they there or did they just drop a submission in saying we don't want anything? Uh, what did they do? They sent a submission in. Senator. Did they appear? Did they talk to it and all that? No, they didn't. Okay, who are they? It's not in, I don't have them here, do I? No, they are a... So it's on page 185. Oh, what have I got? I think we start at 186. Oh, I didn't, didn't, you didn't get the whole list. Oh, 180, oh, there's numbers at the top, sorry. I got one, oh, 185, they're 185. in the middle. McLean, okay, thank you. Jane, who are McLean? Who is McLean Technical Services? They're uh, a consulting or an engineering I don't, No, you told me that. Yep. Who are they? Is it one fella sitting in a bedroom oh. somewhere uh, Sorry, on the Senator. coast, or, or what are they? We don't have that, that detail, but How we can, can we find take out. Them? Yeah. Oh, OK. Please find out everything about McLean Technical Services. I have a problem when there's consultants that come in and try and determine policy. Uh, if they're just dealing through their own, are they... Anyway, you find out everything for me, who they are, where they are, who they represent. <laughs> What are you saying? I can't read that quick. What's it got? Well, he's it, saying that the quality and consistency of Australian roads is such that you wouldn't want to put ESC. Oh, this bloke's a clown. Anyway, you find out who this clown is for me, please, and come back to us. But the trouble is, did he have a weighted... You had to present... No. He didn't? Did you just say, let's just ignore him and... Or does... What happens? I think, as um, Ms Nakangama indicated, it's not a voting system, so we'd look at the arguments that, that, that people would present, and if they're not... Um, if they're not sensible arguments, it's not going to unduly, it's not going to influence but the outcome. Just okay. like we, just like yeah, we the do. Like we do. The department responses in yeah. the right calendar, mm. the right column. Okay. So, so no, these, these uh, ministers don't sit around and say, oh, we must no. listen. Oh, okay. Thank goodness. No. Thank goodness for that. Okay, so of the ones, I'm even going to ignore that, that one. Uh, so let's go back here. So we've got six that either straight out 6A or favoured 6A. There was two of them that favoured mm. 6A but went for 6C. We have three that favoured 6C. Well, that makes, actually, that goes down, that's five. Three. Uh, and we've got, no, we've got, sorry. I'm just trying to count. You told me that's a 6A favourable. That goes to six. Five. We've got three, six and three, nine. That's it, nine. So six that favoured 6A, and of those six, two ended up saying they did favour it, but they go with 6C. Of the 6C, we Seven. have three. Then we have one that wanted 6B, which was Queensland. So this gets put onto the ministerial... What do you call it? What the, the minister, the what do you call it? Is this where all the ministers it's come around? It's not, it's not the federal government. Okay. He can the the Transport and Infrastructure Council. Council. Yeah, not, not, in, not in this case. So Australian Transport Sorry? Advisory Council. No, we, we don't go back to the Transport Inf and Infrastructure Minister's Council f on the RIS outcomes for this. So they prioritise the work to be done. So the, oh, cool. the RIS reinforms our <laughs> recommendation to the, to the minister who administers the Motor Vehicle Standards Act, who makes the Australian design. Oh, so our federal minister took all that and then made yes. the decision? Yes. That's right, Senator. So can I ask Mr Hoy, and, and again, the, with, without prejudice, this question, so just either answer it as faithfully as you can or don't answer it at all. Listening here today, we're not ruling out the possibility that this technology will be in every vehicle at some stage in the future. 
We've got it in some. We're looking, at, we're reviewing our decision around some, and we think that, you know, maybe it's looking positive. And then we've got this remaining cohort of all the rest uh, that you've indicated may come, oh, sorry, it is intended to bring them back into the decision making fold at some time in the future. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that every vehicle in the country um, potentially will have this uh, this technology. Mm. Yes, that's a good summary, Senator. Okay. Yeah, but what decade? Oh, well. Because the way, the way it works is you're taking a tiny segment and you're doing it very, very slowly. What will actually happen is there won't be a vehicle made without ESC by the time you well, just complete well, your process. Well, well, hold on, Alex. Let's ask them. Is, is, do you have any sense of how long this task will take? To let's let's do, let's break it into two parts. You've got a current revisit on a category. Do you have any sense of when you, you would like to be in a position to recommend to the minister or however it's done in relation to that? So my sense would be, um, yes, the, the group that we're currently looking at is within the action plan, the current action plan, which was agreed by ministers in May. That takes us to 2020. Um, we will, before that time ends, be looking at the next road safety strategy and action plans, and we'll be looking at what the, the critical items there, the next um, thing to work on will be. Which so would be this other be, cohort. Well, so in answer to no, Senator, no. so there's no prospect of this remaining cohort, the missing children, being considered between now and 2020, or now and when the next plan is adopted? It, it's not in the plan, Senator. That's okay, so that, all right, that's good. So you've helped in timeline this. Mm -hmm. um, you're hoping to have it in the next plan, but that's not, that's not black and white at this point in time. Um, Senator, I just probably, what, it's very difficult to say definitively what I suppose we are focusing on the very the next big cohort which is the the ones that we were talking about that are under yes. review at the mm. moment and we'll be expecting the risk of, on that to be completed probably by the middle of next year mm -hmm. um, the time frame after the risk is actually completed before an ADR is comes into effect is that around 12 to 18 months or yes, so Senator Gallagher has been right to raise it, so yeah. it'll be It'll be two years-ish on the current second category that are under consideration, and definitely more than two years with respect to the others. So, if if there is some in, if there is some road safety imperative uh, in relation to this, to the safety of lives and, and injury, that seems to me. I'm, I'm going to join Senator Gallagher, and that seems to me to be a long time to to deal with this. I mean. Is there no way uh, that it be elevated and dealt with more quickly? And, and do you tell me you can't revisit the plan uh, to incorporate this other cohort of vehicles before 2020, even if it makes it into that plan? Is that what we're hearing? I think, Senator, one thing that I'd note is there are a number of other um, safety um, <coughs> matters that we're looking at in the context of what's in the plan. So. We, we will continue to review the data. If there is a, an increase in accidents in that cohort that sort of we're missing out on the three and a half to four and a half, if there was a spike in accidents where you thought an ESC would make a difference, there's the sorts of things that would trigger us to revisit, um, work with our state and territory coll colleagues to actually re yeah, but revisit I, that Ms. Spencer, process. I don't get this. Is this a resource issue? Yep. Is this a resource sure. issue within the department to be able to get across this stuff in a in a more timely fashion? I mean... There are certain time frames that go... When, when you are undertaking public consultation processes, there are time frames that um, we, we do... We do it all the time, Ms Spence. Yeah. This committee does it all of the time. And it's measured normally in months, not years. We're talking about years. Well, I here. think there's a combination of the time, the time that's taken to do the actual work, which we're measuring in months, but then there's a the lead time, and I fully appreciate um, there's going to be a reaction to this. There is there's a time frame between actually making the decision and it actually industry being prepared and implementing oh, well. it. So that's. I the think what you're going to find is is a bipartisan bloody uh, um, some publicity about this. This is, in my view, unacceptable, unacceptable timelines, and it would seem to me, and I know you can't comment. I'm not going to try and force you to. It would seem to me that there's a resource issue involved. 
There needs to be more qualified professional people dedicated to the task to bring it out sooner. All right? Now that's just, I'm, I'm just expressing my view. But I doubt that we'll let this lie. This is, they are in ordinate time frames, and in fact with the other cohort, the two and a half or the four and a half, it's, it's the never never, it's the ether. We don't even know for sure whether they're going to make it onto the plan. Mm. And even if they do, the plan's going to be considered when in 2020? 2020. Well, Senator, would it So when, when in 2020? I want to know. I don't, because I, I, I want to, I'm interested whether it's the 31st of December 2020. When, what, um, does this work on calendar years? Does this work on financial years? Oh, there are usually two Transport and Infrastructure Council meetings a year, and I'd have to take on notice whether it's scheduled to go to Let's the first do that, one please. in 2020. Let's come back with the date that even if it does get a, a, a jersey, what <laughs> date it might be in a plan that's presented, right? And Senator, the other thing that I think might be, if if the the um, the committee would think there'd be value in it, is just to provide the bigger picture about what other uh, ADRs that we are looking at in the context of what's already in the action plan, so that people don't think that we are just sitting and Senator, waiting but we're not for... we're not challenging the fact no, that but I just all your might people be are properly applied. Yeah. I'll be writing to the minister personally on this, right? Because I've now I, I, at first I was about to defend defend everyone when Alex asked the question, but um, I, I'm going to write to the minister. I'm going to put on the record that I think it's unacceptable that we're years away from potential consideration about the adoption of technologies that clearly, clearly can save lives. Yeah. And in fact, in fact, <coughs> I'm not directing this at you, Ms Spence, or you, Mr Hoy. It now confounds me why they weren't in the earlier assessments, right? If they're, if they're, if they're about to be reassessed and adopted, why weren't they in the earlier assessments, right? So we're, we're, our committee will take this up with the minister. That's not your problem. But I want to ask you this. If we're able to persuade the minister and resources were not an issue, um, can you do anticipatory work in relation to this other cohort that is sitting out in the cold at the moment? Could you do the work if you had the resources? Forget about it's not on the plan, forget about it may, may never be on a plan. You, you, you would be able to do the work if you're properly resourced around this particular question, correct? Um, I suppose... I if we if we had additional resources for just other things we'd be doing, but we would I'm also not be looking at. I'm going to put you in an uncomfortable yeah, position, Ms. Spencer. Yeah, just I, answered my yeah. question. Could, Chair, Sharon, can I just look? To... I'd like to just put on the record. I think actually yeah. the people yeah. on that yeah. side of the you know this hearing actually know the benefits of this technology better than everybody on this side. This is a process and resource uh, problem, because, and, but it's not confined to ESC. It'll be the same with AEB. Course, Senator, It'll be the, the same sorry. with any technology that we want <coughs> you to be nimble on. The process doesn't allow you to do it. So, Senator, I suppose that's the point that I was trying to make. We will look at the data and find out where the best, the the most effective interventions actually are. And so, whether the doing an ADR which mandates. Um, ESC for vehicles in that 3.5 to 4.5 category, that might not be the best best area to be focused on. There may be but other. You can't give us evidence on that today. No, now, I can't. As, had you done the assessment and said clearly the benefit is here, then we would have accepted that. Yep. But you, the benefit, but, the cost benefit analysis, or if that is the wrong um, well, they did do description, the assessment and de determined it wasn't there, right? So that's, that's yeah. not a fair observation. They did it and determined it wasn't there. Well, they, this is they can't supply it. No, no. Well, we said we'd well, we supply it on notice. Yeah, Senator. they're going to supply it on notice. But my, my, my problem is two problems. One is that I, I think around road safety, if there's any technology that can save a life, we need to consider it, particularly when the industry is not resisting it. Right? They're prepared to pay for it, they tell us. Um, or, or that's been the briefings that I've had. Is that consistent with what you guys have had off the industry? Mm, just takes time to bring it in. Though. And the second one is, it seems to be an inordinate period of time to, to, to do these assessments. But look, we don't, we don't have any more time. We're at I just time. want to one on those before you go, if I can. Yep. Thanks, Chair. Um, if you could just take this on notice, could you please provide to the committee the reasons for the minister's decision to take the completely different angle from the rest of the submitters to come up with what he came up with? Yes, Senator. Please. Thank you. 
So, Thanks, Ms Spence, uh, questions on notice. Uh, the committee so resolves the 17th of December uh, yep. to, to have them answered. Uh, please do what you can for us there. Um, and if you're having difficulty with any of them, do what you can with as much as you can. <laughs> And, and so we don't hold the whole bundle up because uh, we just love sitting around Christmas Day reading answers to questions on notice. Uh, Mr Hoy, thank you for your effort. You, 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 I found you to be a very acceptable witness and you did respond to our indicators, as, as with the rest of the panel, but I, just, I know that today was about you. I don't think this is at an end. Um, and we'll be writing to the Minister, I suspect, if I get the support of our colleagues to point a few things out. And, uh, no doubt he'll call on you for a cup of tea. All right, unless there's something else, we now, we now, we now uh, what, are we, what are we doing? Stand adjourned. We stand adjourned. Thank you.